Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start our talk. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out on another beautiful, sun-drenched California day. Oh, I guess I should have read this in advance before coming up here. Um, seriously, it's great to see everybody here today. And on behalf of Stanford Medicine, uh, I want to thank you for taking some time and sharing part of your weekend with us. Um, my name is Michael Clays, and I do communications for the Stanford Cancer Institute. That basically means that my job is to help share with you some of the things that Stanford does related to um, studying, treating, and preventing all forms of cancer. Um, and as someone who's always on the lookout for a good story, I say we have a really good one for you all today. Um, our two presenters, Dr. Kimberly Allison and Mark Pegram, are each outstanding cancer specialists and dynamic individuals in their own right. But the improbable intersection of their personal and professional lives creates a unique and really inspiring journey. Two Stanford faculty colleagues whose careers and lives are dramatically intertwined around, a breast, can around breast cancer and a drug called Herceptin. But I'll let them tell you about that. The only other thing I want to say in the way of pre-introduction is just a quick word about Stanford. This is really a unique place, and it's not just because of all the palm trees or all the patents pending or the beautiful, fabulous architecture like we have here at LKSC. Um, and it's really not even about all the gigantic brains that are orbiting around this campus. I like to say, I like to argue that it's much more about the gigantic hearts that are attached to those brains, and I think we're going to get a really good example of that today. Dr. Mark Pegram is a Susie Wang Hui Wong, sorry, professor. I practiced that so long, and I messed it all up. And the co-director of Stanford's Molecular Therapeutics Program, as well as the first director of our breast cancer program at the Stanford Women's Cancer Center. He earned his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of North Carolina before joining the faculty at UCLA, where he played a significant role in development and testing of Herceptin. He later spent five years at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where he was a Sylvester Chair Professor of Medicine and the Brahman Family Breast Cancer Institute and Associate Director for the clinical research for clinical research in the University of Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. He is a renowned clinician and scholar in breast cancer research and an in-demand lecturer. Um, I like to joke that he has more frequent flyer miles than Hillary Clinton does. And he's an energetic leader of our Stanford Cancer Institute's effort in what is known as translational medicine, and that's the agonizingly long and difficult process of advancing new cancer treatments out of mice and into actual people. Our first speaker is Dr. Kimberly Allison. Dr. Allison is an associate professor and the director of Stanford's Breast Pathology Service. She graduated from Princeton University, earned her MD at New York Medical College, and completed her pathology res residency and fellowship at the University of Washington, where she went on to serve as the director of breast pathology until 2012, which is when we stole her away. She is herself a breast cancer survivor, an experience that she chronicled in the grippingly personal book called um, Red Sunshine. We all have a copy. Um, this is really a fabulous read. Um, I like to joke with her that um, it ought to come with a box of Kleenex. But I'll tell you, I'll steal her line, which is that, let me tell you, it has a happy ending. So, um, Dr. Allison is also a contributing author for Dr. Julie Silver's Chicken Soup for the Soul, Hope and Healing for Your Breast Cancer Journey. Here at Stanford, she conducts research uh, in a number of areas, including some of her current activities in the development of higher quality diagnostic standards and novel diagnostic and treatment related tumor markers. So will you please welcome me in first joining Dr. Allison and Dr. Pegram. All right, mic on. Good morning, and um, thank you all for coming out on a Saturday to expand your minds and um, engage in some learning on a, on a sort of dreary Saturday morning. So where better to be than in a bunch of talks to learn about health and um, understanding breast cancer biology is the topic I'm going to talk about. Uh, so as Mike mentioned, I'm the director of breast pathology, and one of the things that I think is so special about Stanford is that we have a breast pathology team, and we have a very specialized 
um, group of pathologists that any time there's a, a breast biopsy or a surgical specimen, it gets reviewed by that specialized team who also goes to tumor boards and interacts with our specialists in oncology like Dr. Pegram, um, radiology, radiation oncology, surgery. So we have a very specialized team that, that I think makes this place unique in many ways. Um, I'm also involved in training our next generation of pathologists. And I, I, I didn't know what a pathologist was when I went to medical school, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we do and how we do in terms of breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, so as Mike also mentioned, I'm not only a pathologist who studies breast cancer and diagnoses it for a living, I've also been on the other side of the coin and have a personal story that I'll, I'll share with you as well a little bit about. So how many people in this room want to know the answer to this question, right? I certainly wanted to know, you know, when I was diagnosed, all of us have probably been touched by this disease in some way, will we find the cure? And I think the first question we really need to ask is, well, what is breast cancer? Because understanding the underlying biology of breast cancer is really key to understanding how to prevent and treat it. And that's what I find as exciting in, in my job is because I'm studying the biology of the disease. Because breast cancer is not just one disease. I look at uh, breast cancer slides all day and each one looks different. You can see for yourself in this, you know, images that each of these looks unique and different. So breast cancer diagnosis and treatment really begins with the pathology diagnosis. So I thought I'd walk you through a little bit of how that happens from biopsy to slide to what I look at and characterize under the microscope. So first, of course, tissue samples taken. Then it gets uh, embedded in a little wax block called a paraffin block. So the tissue actually gets put in, in wax. And then it gets mounted on a machine called a microtome, which is sort of like a deli slicer. It's got a very sharp blade. And thin sections are taken off of it with, you know, we have histotechnologists who work in the lab and they're very good at the art form of creating these thin sections that then get mounted on a glass slide, sent through a machine that stains it, the beautiful purples and pinks that I see under the microscope once it gets to me. So once I get the slides, I'm interested in characterizing a bunch of features about the cancer uh, in terms of the, that will pr help predict behavior of that cancer. So what type of breast cancer is it? Is it ductal? Is it lobular? Is it a special type with a special type of prognosis like a mucinous or a tubular? There are many names. The vast majority though are invasive ductal carcinoma. I look at the grade, so how well differentiated, how like normal breast tissue is this cancer? Is it making nice glands that look like normal ducts, or is it really poorly differentiated in just sheets of ugly cells? And that helps predict how aggressive the cancer is. How big has the cancer gotten? We look at the, the radiology. We also use our gross pathology and figure out, okay, how, how far has this cancer gotten in terms of size, and that can help predict behavior. And then lymph node status is a very powerful predictor. So has the cancer spread to a lymph node? All those things help us predict behavior. But what's really changed in the last several decades in terms of diagnosing and my job, I'm not just telling the oncologist what you're dealing with. You have this kind of cancer. But we're looking for targets. So the stains that we do in our lab help decide which treatments that patient's a candidate for. So one of those is hormone receptors, estrogen and progesterone receptors. We stain every new breast cancer with antibodies to those and, and determine whether that patient's a candidate for hormone therapy, like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. We also stain every breast cancer for um, a protein called HER2. And HER2 is overexpressed in about 10 to 15% of breast cancers. It's a growth factor receptor, so these cancers grow like crazy. They're, they're more aggressive type if they're HER2 positive. But there is a uh, targeted therapy that's been available since about 2006 um, that Dr. Pegram worked on, Herceptin, and now there are many other drugs that also target HER2. 
So that's something that will characterize from the pathology standpoint, either by protein expression or looking at the genes involved in creating that protein overexpression. So we have two targeted therapies right there, hormone targeted and HER2 targeted. And then we look at proliferation. How fast is this cancer growing? Chemotherapy stops cells that are dividing. So the most rapidly proliferating tumors are more likely to respond to chemotherapy. And the slower growing ones may not benefit from chemotherapy. So that's another marker that we look at to predict which therapy to give. So there are those specific types of breast cancer where we're looking at hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive, rapidly proliferating, slowly proliferating. But when you look at the diversity of breast cancer biology, you really, the further you delve into looking at either the expression of the genes involved in breast cancers or dial down into the mutations that are present, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas did a um, big project where they sequenced a whole lot of breast cancers and they found that you know, they were hoping for another mutation they could target, something that would be present in a lot of breast cancers and boom, there's another drug we can develop. But what they found was that there are a lot of very unique mutations that are not common. Once you get past the hormone receptor related genes and then HER2 and proliferation related genes, that there weren't a whole lot of targets that many breast cancers had. So you really had to get precise and personal and unique to find additional targets for different patients. So I guess the answer to this question, will we find a cure for breast cancer, is really when you understand how diverse the biology of breast cancer is, is that we'll find new cures for breast cancer. And we have found new cures for breast cancer. We, we have been very successful in treating specific forms. So, so in summary about the pathologist's role, I see myself as a translator of all of that biologic information an integrator of all of that biologic information that then gives me the opportunity to work with the treatment team and the patient and all of us together can come up with very personal individualized treatment decisions. And, and so it's all part of personalized medicine. You may not meet your pathologist, but we're working behind the scenes to help characterize the biology of the disease process. So personalized medicine is a big buzzword, but I, I always say, you know, medicine's always been personal. You always have had a personal relationship with your doctor, your personal relationship with your nurse and the rest of your healthcare team. Um, and it's not every day that, you know, you share personal stories when they relate to your own health. Um, so having been a patient on the other side um, of the microscope, uh, has really transformed a lot of how I see my role as well and, and understanding what a patient's going to go through uh, when I make a diagnosis and what details in my report may make, you know, a patient have radiation versus no radiation or a specific type of therapy. So, so my personal story, um, I was 33 years old, no family history of breast cancer, had just been given the role of director of breast pathology at University of Washington and had just had my second child. I was back from maternity leave. I was back at work and Henry there, he was seven months old and I was still breastfeeding and I, two weeks after I'd taken on this new role at work, I went into my own gynecologist and said, you know, there's something not quite right here and she was very worried. and sent me on this whole journey where all of a sudden I was walking my own biopsy down the hallway to my own lab and saying, you know, actually I was pretty confident it wasn't cancer. I was like, I'm young, you know, I do this for a living, I don't have a family history, I'm, I'm healthy, and this can't possibly be happening to me. And so I, I dropped the biopsy off at the lab and said, you know, skip the resident this time, like have this go right to my colleague, I'm not that worried. And then I remember the next day, you know, a little bit of a sleepless night, sitting in my office and waiting for the pathology to come back. And that's you know, what every patient, <laughs> I understand the wait for pathology now, the anxiety that you go through and the, uh, you know, your mind goes to the worst of all possible things while you're waiting for results. And uh, so, so I waited and waited and thought, gosh, this is taking longer than I thought it would. And 
and I notice that my colleague who's going to be reading my biopsies door is closed. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, maybe this isn't good news. And then she shows up finally at my office with another colleague who is at another hospital usually on that day. And I knew the, sec the second I saw two of them together that, oh, they're, she's there to help deliver bad news to me. And so you know, that sent me on a whole cascade of, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. This is, you know, I, I can't possibly, the time between when you get your diagnosis and when you first meet with your doctor, even when you are a doctor, <laughs> is just extremely painful. You're, you really go through a lot of anxiety, um, which I understand. So this, this book, um, I just wanted to give a disclaimer. It is not a physician's recipe for success book. This is not, this is a memoir of a 33-year-old woman who is freaking out and, you know, going through this journey and trying to find the silver linings in all of the process. Um, so you can get the unabridged version if you want. But, you know, I certainly didn't expect to be on this journey. No one ever does. It really felt like I was Alice going down the rabbit hole. And um, you never expect to get what you diagnose, I guess. I, I remember being home shortly after my diagnosis and my director called me and said, you know, hey, I know we just made you the director of breast pathology and that might be hard for you to be diagnosing that as your specialty after this. And would you like to switch to prostate? Something I couldn't get, right? <laughs> and I, that had never occurred to me, actually. I, I was more than happy to be in the field and able to you know, fully understand what treatment was like after going through it to, to continue to specialize in it. Um, so, but of course, as a pathologist, I wanted to know exactly all the details of my diagnosis immediately. So uh, there's a whole spectrum of breast cancers as we talked about. Mine was very big. Most of the breast cancers that we pick up by screening are very small, maybe a centimeter. Mine was eight centimeters, it wasn't screen detected. I was nursing, I had no idea this was going on. So it, it was advanced. Um, it was high grade, so poorly differentiated. And it was hormone receptor negative, so we didn't have that target to use. But it was HER2 positive. So remember, that's the protein that there was a new antibody therapy just two years before my diagnosis that was approved to be used in a non-clinical trial setting like mine. So that gave me hope because I, it was already in my lymph nodes. I knew this was a really aggressive biology. I, of course, went to the internet to figure out if I was going to survive, and I plugged in all the numbers I could into any calculator that I could find. Will I live or die? Don't we all do that? But, you know, there's no answer. There's no, it's all statistics. It's, it's, it's all, and it's based on frequently really old data because you have to wait for all of that trial data to come in. So when I looked at my survival rate and saw 40%, you know, thought, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna see my kids grow up. But I, I had this hope because it was HER2 positive that, you know, the drug that was new, that was out there was gonna help me and was really um, showing increases in survival rates and cures. So my treatment plan, um, involved doing chemotherapy first because I had a locally advanced large cancer, and so that was standard um, to, get it, to get it first. And I had a um, regimen that included this cherry red cocktail here uh, called adriamycin, and it had this horrible nickname, the red devil, and it's one that you know, patients like to avoid getting. Um, and so, and then I was gonna have, have that for three months, and then the second three months have Taxol and Herceptin, Herceptin, the antibody therapy. So for the first three months, I knew I was gonna get the Red Devil, and I thought, okay, I have to embrace this therapy. This is my shot at survival. You know, I don't really wanna take it. Nobody really wants to sign up for chemotherapy, but I'm gonna embrace this, and the Red Devil is gonna be my red sunshine. So that was the title of my book, trying to find the silver linings in, in all of this. Um, so I had surgery, 
after chemotherapy, I had radiation after surgery, and I continued my one year of the antibody therapy with Herceptin. I also participated in a number of clinical trials, which I think is another huge strength of Stanford is the availability of clinical trials, and I always encourage people to seek that out um, when they're thinking about treatment options. So, so that was my treatment plan, my personal plan, my uh, medical plan, and I knew that taking all these drugs would help heal the cancer, heal the body in some way, but the healing the rest of me was a whole other story. And I think that's something that I really learned uh, going through this process was, you know, as, as an oncologist, you know, you can say, I'm signing you up for this therapy that's going to cure you, but how do you survive this whole process? And really that's through connection to resources and connection to other patients. And I found a lot of strength in meeting with other young women that were going through something similar. Um, and and I, I think that's part of what motivated me to, I was a little nervous to publish my um, very personal story, but I felt like when I heard other women's personal stories, it helped me to understand you know, what it's like to actually go through some of these treatments and emotionally what, you know, how you survived, basically. So I think that that's a critical aspect of treatment. Um, and then I had the unique ability to confront my disease directly under the microscope. And I remember putting my slide up on my microscope and talking to it and telling it, you know, just wait, <laughs> you're going down, I'm going to uh, get that HER2 therapy targeting you. And, um, and, and I think there's a lot as a patient, you know, even one who's very educated in the disease that I had, there's still a lot of um, how, how, why, how did this happen to me? Did I do something wrong? You go through this whole process of, you know, was this voodoo? Was this something I did? Was it something in the water? And, and really to let go of that and acknowledge that, you know, people make mistakes and so do cells. This is biology has accidents and that's, uh, you know, the broad picture of what we know. There are many factors involved in how cancers occur and what factors may be involved in increasing frequencies or decreasing frequencies, but you know, an accident happened basically. So I had a lot of uh, high points. I, I actually you know, circled the wagons when you're going through treatment. If you have a good support system, and I was incredibly lucky I did, I felt very surrounded by a lot of people who would support me, and it was a very positive time in many ways. But of course, there were uh, low points, and one of those was when I was halfway through chemotherapy. So I did the adriamycin, the red devil. I was done with that. I had cytoxan with that, and I thought, okay, those are the big guns. They were the really toxic therapies, and now I'm switching to Taxol and Herceptin, which you know, it's more targeted, but it wasn't as scary sounding as adriamycin. And, and I was in part of a study where we had a um, imaging done in the middle of our treatment. So after I was done with the adriamycin, I had a MRI and a biopsy. And I was really hoping that it was gone because I knew, you know, my best shot at long-term survival was for there to be no cancer left after the chemotherapy was over. I thought, well, maybe it's gone already. And I looked at my images with the radiologist and, you know, still big dark storm clouds on that MRI. They'd broken up a little bit. And the biopsy I looked at, you know, still the same cancer there. And so, you know, and I, and I got pretty sick. I had to take a little break from chemotherapy for a couple of weeks. And so that was sort of my low point. And then, you know, went on to the antibody therapy and my hair started growing back and you know, I'm thinking, oh no, this can't, you know, it's not stopping all the cells from dividing. But I knew that, you know, I was still holding out hope that, that the targeted therapy was working and that I would have a complete pathologic response, which means there's no cancer left in the lymph nodes or the breast after chemotherapy at the time of surgery. And, and most patients do it the other way around. They have surgery first and then chemotherapy. Um, 
And so this was me. After I did find out that you know, having that second batch of chemotherapy and the targeted Herceptin completely eradicated the cancer from, from after I waited for my final pathology. Um, and, and I'm incredibly lucky that we were making advances in breast cancer that Mark Pegram was working on, HER2, and um, that we developed a therapy that targeted specifically the biology of my specific breast cancer. And, and really that's where medicine is making big advances in cancer therapeutics, is finding the target, finding the unique biology, understanding it, and it's creating success stories like mine. So I, I am incredibly grateful for all the advances that we made and proud, of, proud to be part of a team that's doing the same thing going forward. So that's all I have in my slides. Um, but now we're going to do a little question. Yeah, now we're going to do a little question and answer. Ready? Um, so I had it because it, my cancer was locally advanced, and um, there are a couple reasons that you probably could speak to as an oncologist better. It's not standard for all cases, right? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the efforts of preoperative treatment is to shrink the tumors to make the surgeon's job more, you know, easy to get a complete resection. So if the purpose is to do a, a smaller surgery, for example, lumpectomy instead of mastectomy, then absolutely a preoperative approach makes a lot of sense in that instance. There are other indications now that have recently come to light uh, because of new therapeutic opportunities. For example, in the HER2 positive subtype of breast cancer, we now have a second generation antibody called pertuzumab or pergeta that's a cousin of Herceptin and it's synergistic when you give the two antibodies together. And the FDA recently granted accelerated approval and it's the first drug ever approved for the preoperative treatment of human breast cancer. So that was just a, you know, a few months ago. And so now the HER2 positive patients, even if they're smaller or modest sized tumors, we often will take the opportunity to use pertuzumab along with Herceptin and chemotherapy in that instance instead of giving postoperative therapy where Herceptin remains the only FDA approved treatment postoperatively. So um, um, each case now is pretty much customized and, and a lot rides on what intrinsic subtype of breast cancer that one has. We also have preoperative endocrine therapy studies ongoing here at Stanford where we're using endocrine therapy instead of chemo because for many ER positive patients, they don't respond particularly well mm -hmm. to chemotherapy and are not likely to have complete disappearance of mm -hmm. their cancer. Consequently, augmenting responses to hormonal treatments with various targeted modalities seems to be very promising. And also there was just a recent new drug approval by the FDA uh, with a new drug called palbocyclib uh, based on discovery research done by one of my undergraduate students in my lab when I was at UCLA, Richard Finn, uh, studied this uh, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor and found that it, it, it was synergistic with hormonal therapy in uh, ER positive breast cancer and that just won FDA approval in advanced breast cancer and the studies are ongoing now to look at that drug in earlier stages of the disease but it really looks like um, it might be a blockbuster. In fact, in that particular uh, new drug indication, there was a trial that was ongoing in stage four breast cancer that had to be stopped prematurely because the drug was so effective and the Data Safety Monitoring Committee uh, said it would be unethical to continue randomizing to the placebo arm. So um, that's very promising in the case of that new drug as well. So there are lots of breakthroughs. And, it's amazing how many of these breakthroughs are based on fundamental discovery research made right here at Stanford. I mean, some of the slides that you saw with a gene chip microarray expression analysis that defined for the first time the intrinsic biologic behaviors of different subsets of breast cancer, all that was work done using technology pioneered here at Stanford and the papers were co-authored by mm -hmm. Stanford professors. So really, uh, that's what inspired me to come to Stanford. And, I think after Kim's talk, you can see why we tried to recruit Kim to come to Stanford, so we're so happy that she came. But, but in, in one more point to your question, not everybody, there's not, if there's ever a question about whether chemotherapy is necessary, you don't want to get it at, in advance of surgery. 
So there are a lot of cases where you don't know right. if chemotherapy is necessarily going to be a benefit until you see the rest of the pathology. Because you remember, you're only getting a tiny sample when you take a little core biopsy. And so sometimes it's better to wait for the final answer after surgery to characterize everything. And one of the breakthroughs as a result of this discovery research here, done here at Stanford is that there are now commercial multi-gene tests available. Uh, for example, there's a 21 gene test done by a company locally here in Redwood City. And that can define patients with ER positive breast cancer who are likely or not likely to respond to chemo. And now we use that test and it has reduced our use of chemotherapy in lymph node uh, negative patients by about 40% nationally. I mean, so that saves a lot of mm -hmm. patients the toxicity, the expense mm -hmm. uh, of chemotherapy when we know biologically they won't benefit from it. And now we have assays based on multi-gene testing technologies uh, to be able to select those patients prospectively, whereas in the old days we used to have to guess. You'd guess based on yeah. size, right? Yeah, Anything over a centimeter would get chemotherapy. Would get treatment. Yeah, so we vastly over-treated uh, early stage breast cancer until the 2000s, really. Can you tell us the breakdown, um, the percentages of the different subtypes of breast cancer, roughly? Sure. Uh, HER2 is, is, uh, is about 20% of all breast cancers. Um, there's a, a type called basal that lacks HER2 and it lacks steroid receptors, so no ER, that's about 15%. And the rest of the lion's share are all estrogen receptor positive, and there's a couple of large subsets within the ER positive group. One is called luminal A that has a very favorable uh, prognosis, very slow growing, very indolent, highly responsive to endocrine therapy. There's another subtype called luminal B that's still ER positive and responds to endocrine therapy that has a little bit more rapid proliferation rate, and that makes up a smaller fraction of the total ER positives. What about, I've heard of triple negative. Yeah, that's the basal subtype. They're, they're somewhat different, but there's a lot of overlap between basal and triple negative. Triple negative is probably a, a term that will go away um, in the near future because there's already research using gene chip array technology uh, that was developed here showing that triple negative breast cancer is also not just one subtype. Mm -hmm. There are at least five or six readily identifiable subtypes within the triple negative grouping, and they have therapeutic implications for the future. One has growth factor receptors, like uh, sim similar to HER2, kind of that story, so maybe targeting those for the, that subgroup might work. One subgroup has a defect in DNA repair pathways, so maybe using DNA damaging drugs or drugs that perturb DNA repair pathways might be particularly useful in that group. The BRCA1 mutated cases uh, fall into that subgroup, for example, that are often triple negative. Uh, there's an immune signature subgroup that's really, really interesting. In fact, there have now been two presentations using brand new um, immunologic approaches, again using antibodies, so again kind of like a, a distant cousin of Herceptin. But these antibodies are called checkpoint inhibitors. And they can basically unmask tumor cells that are using a disguise called the PD-1, PD-1 ligand, um, you know, uh, axis. Uh, that can decorate cancer cells and disguise it from the immune system. And by blocking that interaction, you can unmask uh, these tumors. And there is now clinical data with two different antibodies from two different uh, biotech companies. And they both show robust responses in triple negative breast cancer. And I wonder whether it's this immune signature subtype that might be uniquely benefiting. So that work is ongoing. So these different subtypes within triple negative have therapeutic implications. There's another subtype called androgen receptor positive subtype. So now anti-androgen drugs are being used in the clinic. Yeah, that's really one of my questions. The more we learn about cancer, we learn how complex it is. To me, my simple way of thinking, that makes it harder to solve the problem. But what you've but described and what I've heard, but every, every one of these variations maybe is, is for targeting. Absolutely. that you were given obviously was very successful and you mentioned that uh, Medicare has approved it. Uh, what, what are the statistics uh, as far as the number of people that have received this therapy and are totally cured, some are somewhat cured, mm -hmm. and some are not at all cured? 
That's absolutely right. I mean, Herceptin, you know, works remarkably well for some patients, but not all. Um, uh, you know, Kim was very fortunate to have had a pathologic complete response. We see pathologic complete responses with Herceptin and chemo only maybe 25, 30 percent of the time. The rest of the patients don't have such robust responses, and that's why new drugs like pertuzumab, the second generation HER2 antibody that I mentioned that was recently approved, that increases that pathologic complete response rate from about maybe 30 percent to 50, 55, 60 percent range. So um, uh, you're right, there are mechanisms of resistance to these types of inhibitors, and developing new ways to overcome resistance, I think, is another, it's a challenge for sure, and it's, and it's depressing when you see how smart these cancers are and how they can come up with pathways that subvert mm -hmm. our attempts to hit these targets. But once you understand those pathways, you have another opportunity, and so that opens up sometimes a whole new area of research. Another thing that we've done recently, uh, working with collaborators at Genentech, is uh, they came up with technology to bind chemo-like drugs directly to the Herceptin antibody backbone, and it's called an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, the name of this new drug is called TDM1, and it basically has all the punch of chemo plus Herceptin, but with none of the toxicity. So no nausea, no hair loss, no drop in the blood counts, et cetera. Um, and it turns out that that approach can bypass some of the resistance mechanisms that have plagued us just with Herceptin alone and, and other similar HER2 targeting drugs. So uh, using the antibody drug conjugate might be able to bypass some resistance mechanisms. We have a paper that we just submitted for publication on that topic, actually. So that's very exciting. And TDM1 was just approved about a year, year and a half ago. Um, based on a large randomized phase three trial showing a survival benefit with that antibody drug conjugate approach. And I'm pleased to say there were two Stanford co-authors on the New England Journal paper. So um, I'm very proud of the, the team and the trials that we've been able to do here at Stanford to help out the community at large. Do you have a I, question uh, over here? Yeah, I'm just curious to know, leaving aside the truly experimental um, processes, if it's FDA approved, is it commonly available everywhere in the country, or do people need to come here? If it's FDA approved, it is widely available in the U.S. That said, uh, you know, compensation by payers and whether or not you have insurance at all is still an issue. So it can be difficult to get expensive therapeutics, even in America. Hopefully, things like Obamacare and things like this will, will help. But some of these approaches are very expensive, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not always easy. And sometimes we have to argue with payers to, um, to get approval. I spend quite a bit of time on the telephone arguing with uh, insurance carriers that you know, somebody really should, should take a particular treatment, um, sometimes based on just theoretical principles, because we may not have clinical data to back us up in every single instance. And so that's, uh, that's a tough call, and sometimes we win those battles, and sometimes we don't. Um, hi. I was wondering if either of you can speak to the value of mammograms and what the thinking is about frequency of them. I don't want to be the only one talking. No, you, but, uh, I talked for a long but, um, time. You know, <laughs> you know, mammography, I think, you know, as primitive a tool as it is, and we all wish that there was better technology and there needs to be breakthroughs in breast imaging. There's no doubt about all of those facts. But in the meantime, it is absolutely a valuable tool. Um, and it, it's, it's um, ironic that there have been these cycles about every 10 years or so of, of positive data, the negative data, and it's very daunting and confusing. You have to understand that some of the technologies that were uh, in play during the time some of the older trials were done don't match modern digital imaging techniques and really aren't relevant to the modern era. So now all of the task forces and uh, august bodies that make consensus recommendations do re recommend annual mammographic screening beginning age 40. So that's what I would strongly urge you to do. For patients who have you know, uh, germline uh, errors in, in genes like BRCA mutations, et cetera, we add MR imaging, MRI imaging, on top of mammography and start earlier, obviously, in those, in those patients who are known to have a, a particularly high risk of breast cancer. 
but for patients with average risk uh, beginning at, you know, by age 40 and annually thereafter is recommended. You know, it's amazing um, to see um, in, in city hospitals, uh, you know, we, we often will see groups of patients who aren't routinely mammographically screened, and then across the street at the university hospital, we'll see patients who have mammographic screening every year, and the biology and the difference between the patients just across the street is really remarkable. And to me, you know, even in the absence of any data, uh, made a big impression. I mean, the patients that come into these large city hospitals that don't have the opportunity to participate in screening, they present with larger tumors and much higher stage, and their prognosis is worse. Um, and most of the mammographically detected tumors that we face now in our clinic are often sub-centimeter and no negative. Most of those can be cured. So I think it makes a big difference just based on anecdotal experience, let alone what the data might show. Yeah, that's a great opportunity to pivot to something I wanted to bring up with, with Dr. Allison, and that is, I loved your, your slide, your comment about cells making mistakes, you know, and uh, that there's no preordained uh, um, motivation behind it. But, but doctors make mistakes too, and you recently um, were part of a co-author on a paper that really looked at um, the judgment or the diagnosis made by individual pathologists mm -hmm. on their own. Um, versus a group of experts. Can you talk a little bit about that and what sort of the, the sure. takeaways are for, for folks? Yeah, so that was the B-PATH study. It was in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago, and it yeah. caused a big... <laughs> Wait, don't mumble. It was in the flash. New England Journal of Medicine. Like the biggest... uh, in the New York Times, where they were picking up some of the negative aspects of the study. So the study looked at um, uh, pathologists in the community diagnosing a Set, a test set of breast pathology slides with a variety of different diagnoses on them versus a consensus expert diagnosis to look at consistency. And the good news from the study was you know, we're very uh, high concordance rates for invasive cancer, you know, over 97% of the time, complete agreement. Um, so, you know, that was the good news that we wanted to emphasize. But there, just as in other areas of medicine, there are gray zones in pathology, and the gray zone in breast pathology is in a diagnosis called atypia, or atypical ductal hyperplasia, and it's uh, a borderline diagnosis between a, a DCIS, a ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a very early phase of breast cancer that often gets treated like a breast cancer in terms of surgery. You'll get a lumpectomy and a radiation if you have a, deep, a ductal carcinoma in situ diagnosis. But if you have an atypia diagnosis, you're not quite there. And these aren't separate biologic entities that, you know, it's a spectrum. And so whenever you have a biologic spectrum and you try to put a dividing line in treatment between the two of them, you're going to get variability both in diagnosis and in treatment, probably. So, so that study emphasized and, and you know, highlighted that there can be very big differences in the diagnostic agreement for those diagnoses that are in that gray zone, and that it can be a good idea to get a second opinion or you know, to have policies in, in different pathology practices where they show those kinds of cases that are borderline around to try and come to better consensus. So there's more consistency in diagnosis no matter where you go for your biopsy. Great question. So it translates to big treatment differences because you know the woman with DCIS gets treatment, sometimes hormonal therapy, radiation, surgery. The woman with atypia might have one surgery to see if there's anything worse, and then they're done if there's nothing in that surgical specimen. So Big difference in cost and you know what you're going through. For for the low grade DCIS end of the spectrum, which is usually what the differential is between ADH and low grade DCIS, the outcomes you know, aren't dramatically different. It's all low grade biology, slow growing, you know, early early precursors to invasive cancer. Um, so that is something that we're interested in looking at more in terms of like how big the outcome, survival, or you know, are there real survival differences? Because it's such a good prognosis cancer to begin with, and you know, do we overtreat 
We do. Certain aspects. We vastly overdo yeah. many DCISs because we're not sophisticated enough yet to understand which ones are a true threat and which one would have never bothered the patient lifelong. Kind of like prostate cancer in mm -hmm. men is the same situation. You know, many men die with prostate cancer, um, but it never affects them. And uh, that's also true with uh, ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. Um, we're starting to develop molecular tools to try to tease apart the various risk categories within DCIS. We're even doing a genomics campaign yeah. in the laboratory right now to see at a genetic level, what's the relationship between carcinoma in situ and invasive breast cancer? That's still not clear. It's been offered historically just based on microscopic appearances that they must be along the same path, that DCIS is a precursor to invasion. The invasion just picks up extra genetic hits and becomes a cancer. But there was a paper published here at Stanford by uh, Kim's uh, group showing that based on a small pilot data set that DCIS might actually be a branch of a tree, kind of like a Neanderthal man branch that's not related to the invasive cancer branch. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can tease that apart and, and that might also tell us which ones are a threat and which ones can be left alone. Yeah. Wait, we have, oh, I, have, I have another, you've been patient, I just yeah. have one little basic, uh, another screening question hear a lot about dealing with screening in dense Of course, yeah. And what sort of options are there beyond that? Well, you know, breast density is normal in young women, and so there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the state of California decided that everyone needs to become aware of their breast density if it's found on a report, because it can hide underlying tumors in some instances, but those are pretty uncommon. So the simple answer is the vast majority of women who have density detected mammographically probably don't need to do anything except continue to do their annual mammograms. And when they reach a, a certain age, the percentage of fat will increase in the breast tissue and the contrast ability on the mammogram will improve with age. It always does. Um, so for other patients where there might be an index of suspicion that there could be something underlying a dense mammogram, then the other options are ultrasonography with ultrasound. Uh, physical examination is another good option, and breast MR imaging. But not everybody with breast density on a mammogram should have an MRI and a sono and, and lose sleep, because it is a normal physiologic finding in, in young women. That's correct. So if, if you have a heightened index of suspicion, you're exactly right. If you have a number of risk factors and density, it may be something that's funny on exam, absolutely go the extra mile and get extra imaging modalities. But the sad thing about the law requiring us to report density is it's alarming to patients. They're not sure what to do, and it can get pretty confusing. We get a lot of phone calls uh, as a result of that. and. Um, you know, there, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of the balance between what we're obliged to tell people and what is maybe too much information. Question. Question back there. Oh, sorry, go ahead. For the newly okay. diagnosed cancer patient who wants to be their own best advocate, how can they best go about this? I mean, Dr. Allison would be extreme, but you know, there's the NTCN guidelines, there's what your oncologist tells you, there are clinical trials, there's tests you can send away for yourself. Like, how do you do this best and how do you assimilate that information? Yeah, I think there is a lot to assimilate um, and, and, Thankfully, there are some choices that patients are left to decide, you know, decide for themselves. You have this option, you're in a gray zone, we don't have all the evidence for every clinical decision. And so we, there are some choices to be made in breast. You know, do you want the lumpectomy with radiation or the mastectomy? Do you want chemotherapy or no chemotherapy when you're in a gray zone of whether that'll benefit or not? Um, and so I do think it, it puts the patient kind of in a hard position sometimes to, when, when it's not clear, like in my case, I clearly needed all the things that I got. There wasn't a question. Um, there weren't other options. <laughs> and, and I think that a lot of breast cancer patients are left with a lot of personal choice kind of decisions where when you don't have clear evidence one way or the other, you know, you can add more data to the picture, like send out for the special testing that might help add 
another data point. And then there's also personal preference involved. You know, in your life, do you feel like you could survive this better and it would, you know, which treatment is going to fit best with your life when there are options? It's, it's, I think, you know, for most breast cancer cases, we have great treatments. And it's, it's when you're in a situation where there, you know, isn't, I mean, you probably see this, you know, men can speak to this, but there are times when you want to be an advocate when you're, you know, out in the community and you're not at a major cancer center, you know, and you have to be your best advocate and say to your general oncologist, I, I have lung cancer and I need uh, this, this special new test that may make me a candidate for this new drug that's available and they may not be aware of it. Um, so, you know, luckily Stanford is, is a cancer center that's really rich in knowledge and we know of the clinical trials available. Um, but, so there are different settings when you need to push hard as a patient, I think. Um, if you don't feel like you're getting an educated answer from from your oncologist, Absolutely. you know one of the things that w that Stanford was a leader in nationally was the creation of multidisciplinary clinics, so that when a patient comes to the breast center, they'll see a medical oncologist, a surgical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a psychosocial worker, a geneticist in one session. That said, that is a lot of information to try to absorb in one session, and it is absolutely overwhelming. Um, but it's a, it's a good first start, and um, we have follow-up appointments just so that people can come back with their list of questions. So I strongly encourage you to challenge what you're hearing from your doctors. One of the things I love about being at Stanford is we do have a generally well-educated patient population who challenges us regularly, and I, I absolutely love it because um, they'll bring, you know, the latest papers from the literature and want to learn more about it. And, and so then it's a teaching opportunity for, you know, the residents in our clinic and the fellows and, and that sort of thing, too. The other thing is to always get a second opinion. Um, we even tell our Stanford patients to get second opinions. You should absolutely do it and challenge. challenge Including on your path. <laughs> absolutely, yep. Uh, and we do a lot of them here. A lot of patients come to Stanford specifically just for a second opinion. And that's also important. Hey, how about For example, if a tumor is small and hasn't gone to the lymph nodes and is estrogen receptor positive and you do this genomic test called Oncotype, if it has a favorable result, you can sometimes have lumpectomy, post-lumpectomy radiation, and endocrine therapy like tamoxifen or one of the aromatase inhibitor drugs, and you don't need chemo. And there's solid data to back that up in some instances. So we. We do put those patients through that exact paradigm to discern whether or not they might uh, be able to avoid chemotherapy. That's our, our highest priority is to avoid it if it's unnecessary. We have two people who have been very patient in the back of the room, but really quickly to the question of complexity, we have um, the Stanford Cancer Initiative is a new program that really the, <laughs> the goal is to transform the cancer patient experience and one of the human elements of that is a specially trained nurse oncologist called a multidisciplinary care coordinator whose job it is to be the advocate for the patient, to help assimilate all that diverse information that they get from all the different doctors they have to see and help manage the, the psychosocial aspects of the diagnosis and to really help guide them through and empower them and their family to make decisions that work best for them. So that's something that Stanford is adopting in different, and each um, multidisciplinary care coordinator is focused on a type of cancer, so you have breast care coordinators and ovarian care coordinators and that kind of thing. So that's something Stanford is really adopting and is very new. Now, please go back to the back of the room. I know you've been patient. Thank you.
No, the, the HER, you know, the HER2 gene is not amplified in triple negative breast cancers. And so the HER2 antibodies like Herceptin, Pertuzumab, TDM1, those would be of no benefit in triple negative. There are some new antibody drug conjugates that are being studied in triple negative breast cancer. Uh, right now, those trials are underway in patients with stage four breast cancer. Um, sounds like to me you're in remission, which is a great thing. So fortunately, you don't need that experimental therapy at this point, and hopefully never will. Um, but, there, but there is hope on the horizon that there will be new treatments for triple negative, and we'll probably stop calling it triple negative once these other more nuanced categories become firmly entrenched with associated diagnostics and therapeutics that are effective. So they're actually different than the HER2 receptor. I can envision a similar paradigm with newly discovered targets in triple negative breast cancer, but those are still in the experimental phase at this point, unfortunately. Sir, your question, in, rega please. in regards to personalized medicine and DNA testing, how, how do you recommend or how effective are liquid biopsies or cell-free DNA for disease progression? Or, and do you recommend them? Circulating DNA. Liquid Circulating biopsy, DNA? That's a, that's a fascinating yeah. topic. Yes, it is. And, uh, and in fact, that's a whole other panel discussion. Some of the new technology in this area is also pioneered right here at Stanford by Asher Lizaday and Max Dean, uh, who had a seminal paper published in Nature Medicine just in the past couple of years. And they demonstrated that they can detect cancer mut mutated DNA in just blood from lung cancer patients was, was the topic in the, in the publication. And not only could they detect the uh, DNA specifically from the tumors in the blood, they could quantitate it. And the amount of the mutant DNA in the circulation correlated with the disease burden. In other words, they showed examples in the paper where a patient would start treatment, and as their tumor is shrinking, the circulating tumor DNA would fall, and then when it relapsed, it would go back up. They also showed an example of a patient who, de who developed a new mutation that caused drug resistance to the medicine that they were on, and the percentage of that mutant clone went up as they were failing to respond to that, that targeted agent, for example. So I think there's great promise. That technology is now being applied in other tumor types here at Stanford. We have a breast cancer project underway using the same technology. It's called CAPSEQ. And I think this is going to be another huge opportunity um, for monitoring response. And you know, depending on how sensitive it is, and we don't know the answer to this yet, so far all of their experiments have been in relatively advanced stage cancers. The next challenge will be to see whether we can detect this even in early stage, let's say stage one breast cancer, that would be huge. Because if you can detect circulating tumor DNA in someone who's otherwise in a clinical remission, you know it must be there somewhere, right? That would be of great interest, but it's still a research tool now. It's not commercially available yet. And to be done with a, a non-invasive blood test would be exactly. astounding. Exactly. It could replace biopsies, which would be fantastic. We have just a couple of more minutes. Thank you all for your great questions and your patience. Dr. Allison and Dr. Pegram will be around afterwards for a few minutes if you have additional questions. So, okay, and then. Do you have any thoughts about um, raloxifen versus tamoxifen as a preventive? Sure. I had DCIS twice sure. and so a mastectomy and I took a Rimidex for five years. And then yeah. I had two differing uh, recommendations from two different oncologists. So, I'm so there's been a head-to-head -head phase three trial comparing five years of tamoxifen versus five years of raloxifen as a prevention for breast cancer in women who have some risk of breast cancer. And it actually has shown in the most recent data cut superiority, slight superiority of the tamoxifen. Uh, that said, in some patients, raloxifene may be a little bit better tolerated in some patients. And so, again, it's a personal kind of uh, question. If you start off on tamoxifen and can't tolerate it well, you could switch to tamoxifen. There's also been a prevention trial using an aromatase inhibitor shows, showing that those also can reduce breast cancer risk, though they have their own unique toxicities. So it's a fine balance. The difference in the P2 trial, which was an MCI study conducted by the NSABP, comparing tamoxifen to raloxifen. The differences were rather subtle in my estimation. The, the superiority of tamoxifen was just a little bit. But either are effective, and both are approved. Thank you. Okay, one last question in the back there. Hi, thank you so much for a very informative session. My question was about the post-op pathology testing that's done. Can you shed some light on the different tests? You know, you mentioned this 21 gene testing run by the Redwood Company, then I've heard of Oncotype DX. 
so can you shed some light on the pros and cons of each and you know which one do you find most reliable? And I'm asking, I know that this is a general session. My mom has one positive lymph node, uh, 2.7 centimeters tumor, which was ER positive. So she's just completed surgery, so I'd love to know your thoughts on what's the right path to take. Yeah, so the, the Redwood City Company uh, 21 gene recurrence score assay is called Oncotype DX. So those are one and the same. Um, and it has particular utility for hormone receptor positive, like your, your mother's cancer, um, low stage. So it was initially validated in node negative patients to determine who is high risk versus low risk or intermediate risk and could possibly benefit or not from chemotherapy as, and used mainly as an opt out. Like I would like to not do chemotherapy. I'm hoping for a low recurrence score on the Oncotype DX so I can have this evidence that I don't want to treat with chemotherapy. It's not going to help. Um, you can get a gray zone result intermediate and then you, you doesn't help if it's intermediate. Are stuck yeah. saying gray area. maybe we need it, maybe we don't. And then if you get a high risk recurrence score, you, you know, it def there's definite benefit to giving chemotherapy. And they have validated now in node positive, one to three positive nodes. Um, that was a retrospective uh, yeah. cohort um, in a different era of chemo, not using modern agents. Consequently, there are two large prospective ongoing trials happening now in lymph node positive patients. Um, in one trial, we're taking the intermediate recurrence score lymph node positive patients and randomizing them to chemo or not, because we don't know the answer to that yet either. Mm -hmm. And in the, lymph, I'm sorry, that was in lymph node negative patients. In lymph node positive patients, there's an ongoing trial where even lymph node positive patients that are having a low recurrence score, we're randomizing them to chemo or not to see if we can get rid of chemo even in some node positive patients. That data is still ongoing. It'll take probably a few more years before that data matures but it's a prospective randomized phase three controlled effort to answer just that question. In selected patients with node positive disease, we do do the Oncotype test, particularly in patients who may have other medical conditions that diminish our enthusiasm for using chemo. And so in that instance, if we get a low risk recurrence score and they have contraindications, relative contraindications to chemo anyway, then that gives us high enthusiasm to, to maybe dispatch with the chemotherapy. There's been a lot of discussion today about um, clinical trials and, and certainly cancer clinical trials are very, very important and we have a, a pretty robust effort here at Stanford. If you wanna Google the cancer, the Stanford Cancer Clinical Trials Office, um, you can find a listing and you can, a searchable listing of all the open clinical trials and what the eligibility requirements are. Also, you can go down to the pavilion right here today and they have a, the clinical trials office has a, a table with lots of information and they have interactive um, ap applications for your phone. They have a kiosk in the cancer center. So they're making a real effort to, to reach out and give people access to trials that may be a benefit to them and certainly are a benefit to researchers like uh, Dr. Pegram and Dr. Allison. Thank you all very much for joining us today and I want to thank Dr. Pegram and Dr. Allison. Thanks for coming out to Health Matters and have a great rest of your day.